to early 2016, uh, when he was appointed Executive Director of the ASO. He's in fact the second Executive Director since the office was set up. Mr Carrera worked in senior management positions in the EU in a number of agencies in Spain, Germany, Greece, the United Kingdom, Poland and France. So he's a, a, in a way a product of EU agencies and has vast experience. Um, he also previously worked in the EASO before he was appointed uh, as executive director, yeah, as, as, as you know, management, a senior management role there. So Jose, who I've uh, known for a number of years, I would consider a good friend of mine, uh, will outline in the presentation today how the European Asylum Support Office is playing a key role in the implementation of the Common European Asylum System and how it's committed to translating the core values of the common European asylum system, which are equity and fairness, into practice. And so as to ensure that all of the member states deal with individual asylum cases in a coherent manner. Uh, he will also analyse the evolving role of the European Asylum Support Office, explaining why and how the agency should uh, represent a key pillar in the development and implementation of the common asylum system, and he will also focus on the migration crisis and the role of the European Asylum Office in the hotspots. Thank you very much for welcoming me here today. I am very bad in reading speeches, and my team wrote me a five-page speech, and I decided on a plane last night that I'm not going to read that speech. I'm going to speak from my heart, and I'm going to tell you um, what I think happened uh, in the last 18, 24 months is what has was done about it, what was our role, what happened uh, in terms of migration and asylum management in Europe in general, and what I think is coming ahead. Um, and that's uh, perhaps the three elements of my intervention here today. And I will do it spontaneously rather than reading from uh, some pages. So I may miss a couple of important uh, um, issues uh, with me with that. But, um, and I may get very enthusiastic about some others. So I'll try to keep focus on, on a few ones that are more, more important. Um, so let's start uh, uh, with these three areas of intervention. What happened? How did we react collectively? What was the role of EASO? Um, and what I think is ahead. And I will say it, and I will comment, and I will talk about from the perspective of EASO, from not as, as a global intervening, but as, as, as a EU agency that is much involved in providing support to member states in managing the, um, the migration crisis, and particularly the asylum uh, systems. So uh, we all know and we've seen on, on the TV what happened in 2015, and then aggravated even more in the beginning of 2016. I'm talking about numbers, influxes, particularly from the southern Mediterranean route and from Greece, uh, uh, um, or into Greece from Turkey, in the eastern Mediterranean. The first uh, um, EU-level reaction might have been around uh, April 2015, when the special council meeting comes up with 10 action points, and three or four out of them mention EASA. And it's the first time that a council of ministers mentions um, an, uh, an integrated response to the crisis management, uh, to the, the, the migration the flows, and to uh, uh, a way of dealing with processing um, cases on the ground. So most of these 10 action points in April 2015 are paving the way to what came up uh, uh, just a month and a half later when the Commission published uh, for the first time the European Migration Agenda. The European Migration Agenda has some priorities. The first one is about protecting the, the external borders. Second one is about saving lives at sea. But the third one is about mechanisms, processes of working, and organizing common European response to processing asylum applications. 
there are other priorities in the migration agenda as well, but I'm just highlighting these three of them. This brings us back to May uh, 20, um, sorry, to, yes, to May 2015. Um, what happened after that, um, we had uh, in September, um, the situation got worse. And for the first time, the application of certain practical aspects of the European migration agenda um, led us collectively to the concept of hotspots. In the beginning, there were some jokes about what a hotspot would be, but in practical term, um, terms, a hotspot has been a, um, a way of organizing the processing of case of, of, of interviews and casework at the place of arrivals. And, and, and the concept of what spots have evolved and the contribution of EASO becomes greater after September 2015. In fact, um, we were asked by several uh, Council of Ministers conclusions to have an increased presence in Italy and in Greece. And that changed a lot in our, in our mandate itself. There are articles in the current mandate that allow us to have special support plans. But there's nothing that EASO has done until the end of 2015, and we're just talking about 14 months ago, uh, for an organization that is five, months, uh, five years and a few months old. There's nothing that we have done until the end of 2015, 14 months ago, more or less, that, has, uh, 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 that was close to a field operation. We were mostly um, a think tank, like this institute, um, a supporter in terms of capacity building and trainings. And we had some special support plans, we call it like that, that had a bit of field operations. But again, the field operations were based on, on, on capacity building, training, and curriculums, and some facilitating in certain areas like uh, the, the courts and, 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 and tribunals, working with judges. But again, all of bringing best practices into the table and sharing experiences. Nothing that has to do with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with putting to, uh, an operation on, on the field the way that I'm going to describe to you. So this is September 2015. And, and um, at that time, we all remember uh, the news uh, and, and uh, on the TV, where we saw uh, thousands and thousands of people going through the Balkans. And uh, it's not by surprise that in October, more or less, I think, there's a first summit with EU leaders and uh, Western Balkan leaders. Um, in November, we start looking also at, at uh, November 2015 at, at uh, external causes, at countries of origin, at countries of training, at root causes of migration flows. And in Valletta, we have welcomed, well, the, the Maltese government have welcomed the Valletta summit with the African leaders. So we're starting to see Europe not only trying to organize a crisis management capacity at its external borders, but also um, reviving, because it's nothing new, I uh, will make this point more visible, reviving a general approach to migration management that considers very much the external dimension of, the, of these phenomena. So we have the external Balkans uh, conclusions. We had the Valletta summit with the African leaders uh, in November. And then we've moved on. And uh, uh, the first contacts with Turkey uh, took place. Uh, Chancellor Merkel went on his own uh, first to, 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 to Turkey. And three months later, the result was um, the EU Turkey uh, statement comes out on the 18th of March, so just three months after the Valletta summit. Um, and again, this is addressing the root causes outside Europe and a different approach to manage the internal uh, situations and the, the inflows, uh, inflows into the, uh, the European Union. In all these initiatives and all these conclusions, the ASO, uh, uh, name is mentioned, with a reduced job, with a medium job, or with a big job. 
in the case of the Euturkey statement, we're giving the lion's share of organizing the response on the ground in the frontline member states, both in Italy and in Greece. And that's where we had to jump from an initial concept of hot spots in September 2015 to four or five months later, a big field operation. And I can tell that at that time, I was acting, my predecessor had left, and my operational department had 10 people, including secretary of support. And I was asked to organize operations right now, today, as, we, as I'm speaking right now, we have about 400 people deployed, 300 something in Greece, and maybe about 400, 150 for sure in Greece, in Italy, and about 300 in Greece, permanently. Our figures have been like that. There were times we had more, close to 500, 600 people deployed. Um, and this is not deployed in the center of Dublin. We're talking about some remote areas, despite the fact these are, this is still European territory. Uh, the Greek islands don't have uh, all the facilities and amenities to, um, to set up uh, an office with the conditions that your office have here in, in Dublin and most of the member states have uh, in their own uh, services. We're talking about some of the camps. The larger camp in Lesbos Island uh, is, is at least 15, 20 kilometers outside town. In the hills, there was no electricity, no communications, no mobile communications, no drainage, no water supply, no security, no, no physical installations, nothing. And we had to deploy it uh, from day to night. So this was one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, been confronted with. Um, right now we have about uh, um, 12 offices uh, all over uh, Greece, uh, including uh, a main office in Athens, and we are deploying the numbers that I've been telling you about. Um, the challenges have not stopped here. Um, the statement with... Um, with Turkey uh, came out on the 18th of, um, I think it was a Friday, if I'm not wrong, of March 2016. Uh, the 19th was a Saturday and there was an emergency uh, video conference called by the Emergency Reaction and Management Services of the Commission in Brussels, where all member states have participated, EASO has participated, and Frontex as well. One of the immediate actions coming out of the political decision was that all the migrants in the islands would not qualify for the new uh, ways of working with Turkey. So they would qualify for relocation, but they would not qualify for the admissibility program with Turkey, which in other words, the ones that were already in the island could not be quickly processed and returned to Turkey. Only the new arrivals will be qualifying for that. So a bigger task that we had to do was to evacuate thousands of people from the camps. We did it together with the Greek authorities, and they were transferred to mainland. The stock of migrants are still, some of them, uh, landlocked in mainland in Greece. Um, the new arrivals continue. So for some weeks, we had thousands of people arriving per day, so, but only for a few weeks, maybe one, two, three weeks maximum. And then the influx started gradually going down, 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 down. The average today is below 50 a day. But there are days where there are no arrivals in the Greek islands at all. So did the EU Turkey statement work? Yes, in my opinion, and it's the official position of the Union, it did work. Is it well perceived and welcomed by all parts of society? No, it's well very much criticized by certain parts of society, particularly by uh, certain uh, NGOs that have a different vision and they are welcome to have a different vision. We in EASO, and particularly myself, have developed a lot of work with civil society. I have appointed a civil society officer 
she has now two assistants. We have gone up uh, into um, a permanent dialogue with NGOs and other parts of the civil society. And it's part, they comment on our work program, they comment on our uh, results. So it's a part that should not be neglected. But of course, it's, it's let's say, um, a stakeholder or a number of stakeholders that have many times very different opinions from the mainstream. Um, um, so, uh, with the Turkish uh, agreement, uh, we had to develop on the ground completely new methodologies of work. It's not a normal interview that is done. Uh, it's done on the spirit of uh, uh, assuming that uh, migrants have the same level of protection in Turkey that they have in EU territory. So, it's a, a, a fast track interview uh, with guarantees, of course. So, we had to develop. Uh, uh, during the, the second half of May 2016 and the beginning of April 2016, uh, a new methodology of work. We, in the beginning, had a lot of uh, uh, input from the member states in terms of experts. We, uh, France and, and, and Greece, and, and sorry, and Germany, for instance, uh, pledged it for about 200, 200 experts. They gave us half of that in the couple in the first weeks. But then one of the problems was that the, the availability of, uh, of experts from the member states start reducing a lot and it's still a problem that we face today. So um, with the uh, Turkish statement, we start a completely new page of addressing um, high number influxes of irregular migrants into EU territory and dealing with it in a different way. And EASO is in the forefront, is in, in the forefront, is, is, is it the, uh, the main player, and he has been the main player uh, uh, of, of digesting and then responding uh, with that part of, of, of the work. Um, we're not in the beginning of the workflow, so when the arrival comes, uh, we're not uh, border guards, we're not law enforcement. There's an initial interview, but then if the migrant appeals for any, any sort of, uh, uh, of international protection, is, is handed over to the asylum services of Greece, but then they pass it on to us. And it's, it's the ASO uh, workforce, uh, the ASO, ASO work, workers that do the, uh, the interview. We have case workers, we have specialists on vulnerable groups, we have specialists on, on, on minors and children, we have specialists on, on exclusion criteria, even on security grounds. We have developed models for uh, techniques on interview for all sorts of things. We are adapting all that to the new legislative package that has been discussed in Brussels so that we can be ready for day one when it comes out. We're bringing it to uh, e-learning platforms and we're sharing and we're using it together with the member states. We even reached an, uh, a global level agreement with UNHCR where they're using our materials worldwide. So, um, and this has been developed um, in the last 12 months or so. Some of them existed, some of them did not exist. In Greece again, uh, we all know that the results of, of the eu turkey statement are not uh, impressive. In fact, about only a thousand people have been returned to Greece. There are many factors for that. And a big chunk of those 1,000 people have been returned on a voluntary basis. So they, they volunteer to be returned to, uh, to, to Turkey. Uh, the biggest factor about these results uh, is not that we have not interviewed thousands and thousands of people. is because uh, the, EU, the Greek system is based on EU law, and after the first interview and the decision is dropped, we don't sign the decisions, the Greek system does sign the decision, um, they appeal. I mean, the migrant appeal appeals and it goes to a first instance court. We're also supporting the court in a different ways. Um, um, and once they appeal, the, the process goes for, for at least two years. There's a second level of appeal. There's even a third level of appeal in Greece. The laws have been modified, have been simplified, but it's still very much like that. So the practical result is that the Uturk statement has worked in stopping the massive numbers that are coming from Turkey. 
but has not produced results in terms of returns to Turkey. But the EU initiatives have not stopped with the EU-Turkey agreement that uh, certain countries in February last year start closing borders and building walls along the Balkan route. We also remember uh, that um, um, after the EU-Turkey agreement has been reached, the Commission comes up with two legislative packages. So we have now three dimensions here on the ground. One, to manage directly the crisis and the numbers on which EASO has a, an important role and will continue to have. One that is about uh, starting looking to the root causes, the country of origin and the causes of transit. I'll come back to that. And one that is about um, um, uh, changing the, the, the yaki, particularly the legislative uh, uh, aspects of the yaki. And it came with, uh, with two, two uh, waves. The first one in, in, May, <clears throat> in May last year, where we saw, uh, and uh, that's part of my last element of intervention here, we saw the Commission tabling a new regulation for creating uh, what could be a fully-fledged agency, uh, asylum agency, so the future of the current EASO. Uh, they also reforming, uh, we also reforming Eurodac, and then what could be uh, the evolution from Dublin III to Dublin IV, which is in itself is an entire world. The second wave of legislation proposals came up in July last year, and it is about mostly ways of working, uh, procedures, qualification, and reception. And there's a, a seven area of working, which is the union resettlement uh, proposal. And, and this is very much linked to the external dimension as well. Um, we have um, seen since summer last year intensive work and discussions between the parliament and the member states in many different groups looking into what should be the, the real uh, extent of change into the uh, ways the member states want to work in the future in terms of the common European asylum system. I would like to concentrate most on, on, on what could be the future of EASO. And this is, um, there are, in, in, in fact, there is a curiosity here. Certain documents call it the asylum agency, others call it the, the asylum agency, the, the agency for asylum. Uh, one way or another is AA, and the acronym is going to be EUAA. So we have prepared for that. We have new colors, new badges, new, new, uh, new, new everything. And, and we will present it in our management board in June, and we're ready to start tomorrow if necessary. So, and what comes up in the pipeline uh, for EASO is, um, I would say, to a number of priorities, of course. First of all, to continue with the field operations the way they are. In fact, we're sophisticating it a bit more because in certain major hotspots, we now building um, offices for processing casework uh, outside the hotspots for number one, for security reasons, and number two, to have better working conditions because where we work, it's, it's um, quite basic. Uh, we work in containers. Uh, we work in, in and the sun and winters in those islands are quite harsh. So in the main island, islands of Lesbos and Kios, we are now about uh, finishing some renovation of buildings that we contracted out, and, and soon we'll have um, um, a different uh, capacity to work. We will keep the containers. In the containers, we can process about a thousand, uh, sorry, 100 cases a day altogether in all islands. With the, new, uh, with the new offices, we can escalate it up to 200, uh, maybe 250. And if we build other temporary uh, uh, facilities, it can go up to a few hundred more, but not much more than that. So if, by any chance, the numbers 
uh, of the influx numbers come up to similar numbers of 2015 and 2016 that we all hope that doesn't happen, we'll have a thousand or two thousand or even more uh, uh, cases unattended a day. So nobody wants that to happen, and particularly EASO doesn't want that to happen. And the new agency will not uh, want to have that on our plates for sure. Um, the external dimension has evolved uh, dramatically. Um, I would like to just recall the two last um, um, uh, summits that took place. One again in Malta in February, where um, an informal summit on Libya took place. And there is a, a declaration about that issued by the Council and there is an implementation plan, and more than that, they're leaking the implementation plan to many uh, trust funds that are already operating, the trust fund for, for, for Turkey, the trust fund for Africa, um, and other trust funds on migration, the asylum and migration integration fund, the internal security funds. So the, the Turkish fund alone has about six billion euros, three billion have already been disbursed to Turkey, um, there's, there's, of course, a lot of intentions to link um, um, whatever crisis management policies and action are taking place with prevention, with, uh, uh, with uh, sustainable development, uh, through partnership frameworks, through compact uh, um, um, uh, frameworks as well. EASO, again, is mentioned on many areas. We can support uh, initiatives on, on information campaigns, on supporting member states on, on, on resettlement from those areas uh, of, of, of the world, uh, particularly uh, if the uh, compacts with Africa go ahead. There's at least five countries that have been prioritized, and work has started with, um, with uh, Nigeria, with Mali, with Senegal, with Niger, and there's a fifth one that I just forgot, but there's five priority countries in which um, um, programs have started under a compact approach. The compact word here has to do with linking economic uh, development and economic aid uh, and building migration and asylum elements into that. Um, EU is, has been uh, one of the greatest, uh, if not the largest, perhaps the second, or maybe the, the, the first one. It varies between us and the United States year by year, but the largest provider of external development aid. Um, we will continue to do that for sure, and, and part of, of that aid is now to be linked um, uh, with migration aspects and migration management aspects. Um, what is the role of EASO in that? Um, we have deployed um, a liaison officer for the first time to Ankara. We have been working uh, with, um, with the DGMM, so that's the Director General for Migration Management of Turkey. Uh, they visit recently, and I'm invited to go back to Turkey and to start having an action plan on capacity building and training uh, of, uh, with the main uh, purpose to upscale the way that the Turkish system works in general. This is quite uh, new for us as well and, and quite encouraging. Um, despite the fact of the last political developments, it is in the midst of these political developments that the EU agency is invited to work closer and better with the Turkish authorities. Um, we don't envisage to have any practical operational role there other than um, uh, capacity building and training. And they're very keen in using certain of our models in their own work, which in, in practical terms uh, will not oppose. So we're talking about uh, interview techniques, uh, qualification and techniques. Uh, interviews, um, all, all the, we have about 17 areas that, are, that have been developed on, on capacity building and training. 
and they're very keen about uh, half of them. Um, so you will see soon certain developments of work between us and Turkey directly. On top of that, we have a liaison officer who is very active on, on, on resettlement. Um, I think this is historically what happened in the last 18 months. Um, I would like to summarize it before I go what, what I think is coming up for us and for the EU. Um, we have seen um, a response of the EU that was based on crisis management, on processing cases at the point of entry, and on, 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 on trying to stop the influxes. By doing that, of course, the, um, the root causes of these big influxes have to be addressed. And there's many initiatives that uh, started, I would say, with the Valletta Summit in 2015 with the African leaders. But they have not stopped. Uh, in all these initiatives, EHASO has been at different levels uh, involved. Of course, our involvement was greater with the Turkish agreement and in Greece and in Italy. Um, we have opened recently also offices in, in Cyprus and we're supporting directly Cyprus on a new phenomenon. There's, there's almost a, a, a travel agent like organized uh, smuggler uh, business that is bringing boats regularly every, every week on the same day from Turkey to the Turkish uh, Cypriot side and then crossing them to the, the Cypriot side. In numbers there are um, significant to the point where we got a request to work directly with uh, the Cypriot services and we started about a month ago an operation in Cyprus. Small, about a dozen people, but sufficiently important to open an office in Cyprus. So we have also an office in Cyprus, and we have, of course, other, other programs with Bulgaria and other countries. Um, before I go into the future, I would like to say that everything I've been saying um, has been done without losing sight and without dropping the portfolio that we had before the crisis. And the portfolio that we had before the crisis were based on, on, on curriculums, on training, on capacity building, on forums for discussion, and on summarizing uh, figures, statistics, about the Zion situation uh, in Europe. We have evolved the information part. We have much better products. We have much better uh, um, web-based uh, platforms to share that information. We have doubled, amazingly, but I would like to indirectly, there's none of them is here, but uh, my compliments and admiration to the, uh, to the training unit that has doubled the number of trainings in 2016 with more or less the same stuff. We have developed e-learn platforms. We have uh, developed other platforms where all these materials are, are, are um, available. Uh, of course, these are restricted platforms. Um, and I think um, working with the courts and tribunals also knew uh, a lot of developments. So I think this has been a terrible achievement, uh, considering that many internal resources had to be deviated from capacity building into field operations. So the field operations in themselves uh, were new for us and were also a, a great success. And the proof of that is that continuously, EASO is now mentioned in all the external dimension programs, in all the areas uh, that were traditionally our work, and, and, and the fact that um, the European Parliament and the member states are very actively um, looking into the next generation of, of, of legislation, in which we have jobs in all of them, it's not just in Dublin, who will be the main operators of, of the uh, asylum intervention pools, of the distribution uh, key uh, mechanisms that have to be put in place, on the monitoring, on the guidance. This is all additional tasks that the new legislation is coming up with and is giving to us. In resourced terms, until 2020, we're going to grow 10 times, tenfold, until 2020 compared to um, just before the crisis. 
Last year alone, our budget was amended four times, and, and we went uh, from a few million into almost 75 million. Currently, we have 100, and uh, we just went above 100 millions that uh, we're managing. So uh, that also brought a lot of uh, needs to restructure internally, to uh, have induction courses for the new staff, to absorb the new staff. It's not just having more figures, more on the paper, it's also being able to use them in, in real life, in, in, in the real times. That is something that I would like to highlight as well, which brings me um, a lot of optimism in terms of the growth pattern that we've been achieving and looking for the next three years. If we've done it from this level to this level, we can do it from this level to whatever comes in the future. Um, so, and what is the future? The future for me is about four or five. I prefer to say four plus one. And I will reserve the one to the end. Because the other four will not work without the fifth, for sure. So the first one is whatever we built, uh, we have to have a crisis mechanism able to respond to crisis because crisis might happen again. And we've been busy working on that. Um, there, is some, there are some cliches about uh, lessons learned, best practices, but I'm trying to build them and also use them in practical terms. The experience we built in the hot spots cannot be lost. If something happens again, we'll be able to respond much quicker. We can go up to processing um, 200, 300 cases a day. I can double that, but I cannot never match 10,000 cases a day, and it's not feasible for the unit at all. So we cannot go back, we should not go back to the figures of the beginning of 2016, uh, barely 12 months ago. But should the, the worst happen, EASO and the new agency will be much more able to process influxes than we were um, 18 months ago. Um, one fact for that is that we've created innovative ways of having our own workforce. Somehow they are a bit incompatible to the solidarity spirit of having member state experts working in our own operations. In fact, what we did is recruiting people, training them, and then we have developed our own workforce. Um, is it the right way to do it? No, uh, it's against European spirit, but it works. The truth is, it works. Uh, we have now 400 people on the ground, and a big chunk of that is our own workforce. And this week I've signed another 25, so we're going to increase in Greece again. Despite the numbers are going down, we're preparing more capacity in Greece. Um, so whatever happens, we need to keep a crisis response mechanism. There is, there are some member states that have written about it quite recently at ministers' level that they want even to, uh, there is legislation about it, there is uh, a directive on, uh, on temporary response measures that can be activated but never been used. But certain member states want to build on that. Personally, I'm in favor of it, that should the influxes come up again for any political reason, and we know what Mr. Erdogan has been saying after his recent uh, uh, referendums and, and uh, the changes in Turkey are visible. So if we face those situations again, um, is Europe ready? Is there a plan B? David asked me. Um, so as I know that the answers here, the speech is taped, right? Is the answers are not taped. So I'm taking the risk. Yes, I don't think there's a plan B. The plan B is the plan A, uh, is what exists right now. And um, there, is a, there are attempts to, 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 to have um, some reactivation of the temporary measures directive. Uh, reactivate it again so that we can have institutionalized a rapid response should the numbers come up again. But the entire bet of the EU policies are not to repeat the situation of 2015 and 2016, is to address the root causes. So the number two is about the legislative package. 
So what's going to happen? It's already happening. We're reforming the entire common European asylum system. One of them is a new asylum agency with an expanded mandate. Not going back to that, but I would like to say that the three or four or five main features, there's plenty of them. One of them is an asylum intervention pool of up to 500 experts coming from the member states. This is not voluntary. Right now is voluntary. Once the regulation is approved, is mandatory. And we will define, the new agency will define the profiles, the curriculums, the deployments, and the availability of those experts. And they have to be mandatory trained. So Europe is putting together an agency with 500 staff plus an intervention pool of another 500. So this is also a way to prepare for crisis, but also to prepare for other aspects of the new mandate, monitoring of national systems, guidance on country of origin and statistics, analysis of that, guidelines on that, a permanent distribution key, which is an evolution of the relocation program that has not worked very well, but the permanent relocation key will be also mandatory as an aspect, the main one of solidarity in times of crisis. Um, I think these are the main aspects, and many of them have brought up a lot of disagreement in Brussels. Uh, they've been discussed for almost a year, because these packages came up in May and July last year. We are going into May right now, but some of them are getting to a final uh, stage of discussions. So we are optimistic by nature at EASO, so I think the regulation itself, the new regulation, will come up soon. So this is the number two uh, element about what's going to happen. A crisis mechanism must be there. The legislation package must be finished. What is my number three? I think the external dimension needs to be continued. And it's not me, it's visible. There's a lot of uh, summits saying that. I mentioned the Valet Summit, the, the, the Valletta Summit in 2015. Then, then we have the Balkans, then we have the Turkey's Agreement, then we have now uh, the, the Valletta Statement, which is about Libya. And then we have the partnerships, the compacts, the neighborhood policy. Uh, so everybody is very busy in Brussels coming up of ways of addressing the root causes and linking that to a global approach. Don't forget the New York Declaration. There is also the 2030 2030 uh, Sustainable Development uh, Program, I think, of the UN, which many countries, particularly European countries, but also Turkey in particular, and Georgia and others, have pushed to have and is there now uh, uh, as part of the sustainable global development for particularly for the third world, the migration and even the asylum dimension is written down there, which brings the big donors, and in particular the EU, to the position, and the EU has been one of the biggest supporters, if not the biggest supporter financially and in policy terms, of, of, of transforming those global sustainable develop, UN development targets until 2030 into global compacts on migration and on refugees. It's just not more migration anymore. There are global compacts on, on refugees as well. And we are, you, you, one of the biggest donors on that. So um, then there are the regional um, partnerships with Russia, with uh, the Eastern Partnership, with all the processes, uh, the Budapest process, the Prague process, and these are the Eastern uh, European uh, partnerships as well. We have bilateral agreements that are very strong with Brazil, with the uh, with United States, um, with the ACP countries, uh, which is not a bilateral, but it's, it's a one-to-one, -one, um, with the African um, uh, uh, Union as well. So I, I see all the external dimension in addressing root causes very strong. And there's a lot of resources. And money always talks louder. And for the first time, there are big funds and trust funds being put into migration issues and asylum issues. And they are connected uh, with bilateral agreements uh, with priority countries. 
So I'm not going into the detail of that, but it's again an area where EAS will participate a lot. So we have the crisis mechanism, we have the legislative package, we have the external dimension, and we have the new agency with an external mandate, as I've been commenting before. So these are the four areas that I see as the main pillars of the near future for migration and asylum management, not only for EASO, from our perspective for sure, but also from the member states' perspective. But I promise, and I have now five seconds to finish, that there are four plus one. And this one is the key one. Nothing of this will work if there is not determination, solidarity, and responsibility from the member states individually. So, no matter how much progress will be brought on paper, how many resources will put, be put there, if the member states cannot work together and act together on simple and complex issues, then it will not work again. It's not just the new agency. It's, there are practical things that are not working, and they don't have to do with legislation, with policies, with trust funds. They have to do many times with overcoming bottlenecks. They are practical on the day-to-day -day work. There is, of course, a dimension that is the involvement, the evolution, I'm sorry, from, from directives into regulations. So this will become mandatory uh, law in, in, in the EU. But again, it depends very much on the willingness of each individual member state to uh, make it work faster, better, or just delay it. So four plus one. Thank you very much to listen to me. Um, I didn't read anything I wrote in the plane, and I didn't read uh, my team speech of five pages, but I hope you have enjoyed uh, some insights that I've shared with you today.